go ahead and get started. Uh, obviously, I know there's going to be people filing in. So welcome, and thanks for attending our annual college informa uh, information night evening. We hope it's helpful to you. Uh, I realize that there are parents here who are parents of seniors, and in probably a month or so, or maybe a little bit shorter than a month, you're actually going to be filling out this new and improved uh, FAFSA form. And then others in here are parents of juniors, and you're here to get some information and learn the process for next year. So again, thank you for being here. Before I introduce our keynote speaker, I wanted to mention a few things to everyone. This is the first of three different financial aid evenings we're going to try to host this school year. So tonight's an info night. Um, and then in January, and I'm going to give you the dates in a second, but in January, we're going to partner with Sinclair for their financial aid resources. And we're going to offer completion events, which means if you choose, as a parent of a senior, you and your student can show up at these completion nights you have to schedule an appointment, but you can show up at these nights and you would sit down with a Sinclair financial aid counselor and that individual would help you complete the form. So that might be a good opportunity for some of you. And again, your child doesn't have to obviously be going to Sinclair um, for that to happen. Just come in for those completion nights. They can be going to any college that they're looking at. So those nights for the completion events are January 23rd to Tuesday evening, 6 p.m. to 8 p.m. They're going to take place in the Centerville High School Library, so on the second floor here of our building. We don't, I don't have the information for you to schedule for the appointment right now. So what's going to happen is Claire is going to send us the links and then our district office will send those to the senior parents, probably through Parent Square. The other date is Thursday, January 25th, 6 p.m. to 8 p.m. Last year we did the same thing and I think Sinclair had the appointments in either 20 or 30 minute uh, increments. The other thing, a couple things I wanted to mention, if you picked up the booklet when you uh, came into the theater this evening. And this booklet's going to be online, by the way. It's going to be on our guidance website tomorrow morning, as well as Rob's PowerPoint. But if you look at page one of the booklet, and I don't want to steal Rob's thunder, so. I'm not the expert, and I don't want to talk to you much about the FAFSA form, but I did want to mention on page one is the website that the uh, senior parents are going to be using. And one thing that you can do now, because the FAFSA form's not ready, I believe the government's saying it's going to be ready by December 31st, but you can request your FSA ID. You can do that as early as tomorrow if you want. So the website's there for you to go ahead and get the IDs. I'm going to switch gears from financial aid and talk to you a little bit about scholarships. So on page four of the booklet, we receive as you can imagine, a ton of emails throughout the year from organizations that offer scholarships. So any scholarship that doesn't come through the university, we just simply uh, term those as private scholarships. And Samantha Stingley, who is a guidance counselor in the West Unit, is charged with trying to organize all those. And she has created a Parent Square group and then she lists those scholarships. As soon as they come in, she'll post them to her list. So if you want to join her Parent Square Scholarship Group, the instructions are listed for you. Page five, B, 
Dayton Montgomery County Scholarship Program. So all high schools in Montgomery County are part of this program. And the students, it's for seniors only, the students need to have at least a 2.75 GPA. Most of our students have the GPA. There is a financial need piece to the scholarship, so you also have to have the FAFSA information. But I just wanted to let you know that that scholarship's available. And year in and year out, we have a roughly about 40 seniors in our building that qualify for, for the um, scholarship money. Information will be through the Student Unit Guidance Office in January. And page six, several of our local um, civics groups and our elementary school PTOs and middle school PTOs offer what we call local scholarships available to Centerville High School seniors only. So these aren't huge, huge amounts. I think they range anywhere from $3,000 being the largest to probably $500. <laughs> but they're pretty good deals because the students are only competing with the other seniors in the building. So they're not competing against the national pool or a uh, state pool of students. These scholarships will be available in February. And then one last thing before I introduce Rob. If your student is a tech prep student, so if your child's in one of our tech prep programs, remember they also have the opportunity, if they want to go to Sinclair, they uh, will probably qualify for the tech prep scholarship, which is $3,000. And I guess I failed to introduce myself, so I apologize. <laughs> Um, so my name is Marion Delator. I'm one of the counselors here in the building, and I, I serve as the partner chair. So at this time, I'm going to introduce uh, Rob Durkle. Rob is the Senior Director of Admission and Recruitment at Wright State University. And prior to that, for many years, he was also the uh, Director of Admissions at the University of Dayton. So Rob Durkle, and, and thank you. Very much. like walking and chewing gum at the same time, so we'll figure out how this works. Yeah, I tried retirement, it didn't work so well. I couldn't sit still long enough, and so what did I do? I jumped back into financial aid, which most of us are pulling our hair out today, not knowing what financial aid's gonna be like next year. So I apologize up front if you ask questions and I say I don't know. I really don't know. Uh, I was in Washington this summer for about three days of workshops to try to go over what's going to happen this year in financial aid, and they gave us screenshots but they wouldn't give us, give us screenshots to take home because they said this is not what it's going to look like. So since the month, that this was July, mid-July, since mid-July we've been asking for screenshots just to get an idea. And again, we don't have screenshots yet. So, uh, but I do have some information I think will be helpful for you. Uh, how many were here last year at the presentation? Some of you were. Forget everything I told you last year. <laughs> it's all changing. So we know some of the changes. Don't know them all, but there are going to be some changes here. I think it's going to be changes to the better. If this is your first time completing the FAFSA form. It's gone from 108 questions down to 36. Okay, so it'll be a little bit quicker, simpler, and easier. Any of you who filed FAFSA in previous years and son or daughter got caught up in what's called verification, about a third of all students who fill out the FAFSA have to submit some additional information, which is typically a copy of tax return. We think that will be reduced greatly because one of the processes here that we mentioned briefly, we'll talk about how that tax return automatically gets uploaded into the file this year as opposed to using something called the, the data retrieval tool. So uh, here we go. We're going to try to go through some of the topics we're going to discuss. What's financial aid? What's the cost of independence? Talk about some of the changes. What's the student aid index? What's financial need? Categories, types, sources of financial aid, free application for federal student aid on the FAST form, and unusual or special services. So these are some of the things that we do know that are going to take place for next year. So what's financial aid? It consists of funds provided to students and families to help pay for post-secondary educational expenses. Sir, can you talk a little louder? Oh, okay. 
yeah. You see, can you hear me now? Sounds like a phone commercial. Can you hear me now? Uh, so what the idea would be here is that in financial aid, there are three different types of aid dollars. All aid dollars fall into these three categories. Non-repayable, repayable, and work. So any financial award that you get will fall under the category of non-repayable potentially. So we hear the word grants and scholarships. Those are non-repayable dollars. And the goal is to get as many of those dollars as you can. Okay? The more you get from those two categories, scholarships and grants, the less you have to pay out of your pocket. Repayable refers to student loans. Now, there are some schools that offer payment plan programs as well. So you're repaying something back. It may be at an interest rate, may not. But those are individual to the school or college that you're considering. So there are repayment programs that are available. And then work. Oftentimes students will work on campus. It might be through a formal federal program called work study. But there are schools that have work in addition to work study. So if you didn't qualify for the federal work study program, which is a result of this fast reform we're going to dive into in a few seconds, you still may be eligible to work on campus. So don't eliminate that as being a uh, a no, just because you didn't qualify necessarily for the, the need-based programs. So what's cost of attendance? When you're looking at schools next year, there are things you need to take into account. Obviously, we know about tuition and fees. We know housing, food, if you're going to be living on campus, books and supplies, transportation, and miscellaneous personal expenses that may occur. The thing you have to be aware of in this whole process is when you're looking at the total cost of a school, oftentimes those fees are hidden fees. You may not see that in their publications. They say, here's our tuition, here's our room and board. But when you get your first bill, it's going to show a fee for orientation, a fee for support, computer support, a fee for the library use, a fee for technology, a fee for uh, whatever it might be, a tutor, for example. So when you're searching at colleges, what you want to know is what is the total cost going to be, including everything. So if you come into my office and you're coming to visit at Wright State now and say, hey, what's our total cost? I'm going to tell you, here's what we estimate your total cost to be, including the various fees that you may encounter. Now, we might not know all of the fees at the time because you're doing it now as a senior in high school, uh, and it may change to someone as a sophomore or junior, but not that much. Because you want to kind of get the idea as to what's the total out-of-pocket expense that I'm going to have to come up with. Because that's going to play into your financial aid eligibility. So those are the cost things that will come into play over the course of, of the year. So here's some of the changes that are going to occur in the FASMA. Uh, new terminology, we'll touch on some of those. It used to be that we talked about the parent providing the more support as to fills out this financial aid form. Now, the person filling it out is going to be considered a contributor, change in wording. So it was family, parent, now it's, it's called contributor. Number of family members in college no longer affects what's called the student aid index. If you recall, for those of you who had multiple students in college, it used to be when they figured out, when the federal forum, federal forum filled, figured out for you what your student aid report shows in terms of an expected contribution, you would take that and divide it by the number in college. So if I filled it out and it came back to me saying, I'm expected to contribute $10,000 next year, and I've got two students in college, 5,000 would be for one, 5,000 would be for the other. No longer. The federal government's done away with that. There's no longer the division by the number of students in college when it comes to determining your, your, your discretionary income, which is now called Student Aid Index or SAI. Parents will be invited to complete their part of the FAFSA. What that means is that when the student is filling out their portion of the FAFSA, because there are two parts to it, students and contributors, the student's going to invite the parent, parents, guardians, to fill out the form. So it'll be them sending an email to you as a parent saying you're invited to fill out the form. Here's where you have to be pretty cautious because the email address that your student is using to invite you has to match the email address that you're using when you create your own ID. If not, it's not gonna match. It's gonna have to take a lot of work behind the scenes to try to figure out who matches up with who. So the best thing I could say you could do is when filling out this form is to sit down with the student and the parent at the same time, and you can now start making sure that you're getting things correct, that it's matching up. 
It has to be two unique, uniquely different email addresses, so the student can't use the same email address that the parent's using and vice versa. It has to be two, two different email addresses. And the students should never, ever use their high school email address in filling out any of these forms for financial aid. The reason for that is in the months of May, June, July, August, colleges are sending information to students about their financial aid, and if the school shuts down their email address upon graduation, they're going to miss deadlines, they're going to miss financial aid opportunities, so it's real simple to maybe pick an email address or create an email address that's unique to the student. And then keep that email address close at hand because that'll be the same email address that the student is using in the sophomore, junior, senior year as well. Okay. In this process, when the students are filling out their portion of the FAFSA, when they start, they create an ID, which we'll touch on briefly here in a minute. When they go in, new this year will be what's called a, a contributor wizard or a parent wizard. Who should fill out the form? That was one of the questions we'd always get in previous years. Who should fill out the form? So now there is this wizard that's going to be sitting on top of the student's form where they can go in and plug in who are the contributors in the family. So it might be mom and dad, it might be mom and stepdad, it could be a combination of things like that. But this wizard is going to help the student to identify who should be filling out the form and who should be getting the invite to fill out their portion, the parent or the contributor in this case, the new terminology. Who fills that out so that the student has the right person or people filling out the form itself. I missed one. Parents without a social security number are required to fill out an FSA ID. Everybody who wants to apply for aid has to fill out this federal student aid ID. Think of it as a social security number. That's going to follow the student throughout the entire time they're in school. That means even beyond uh, undergraduate, if they go on to graduate school, go on to PhD professional programming, that ID still follows them there. Parents, that same ID will be used for future children coming down the pipe as well. So if you've got one now for a student, that same ID will work towards your daughter who's now a senior, uh, a son who maybe is a sophomore is gonna graduate in a couple of years, that same ID parents you'll be using when you complete their FAFSA form three, four years from now. So keep that in a safe place because it's like a social security number when it comes to filling out that form. Okay. So here's the new terminology. Expected family contribution is now called student aid index. Those of you who filled out the form previously, that expected family contribution figure was never realistic. It would come back to you saying, well, you should contribute $30,000 next year, and you're like, $30,000? Where am I coming up with $30,000? Where are they coming up with $30,000? Okay. So student aid index is more of an index. It's not what is the parent's contribution. It's what an index number is going to use or what colleges are going to use to determine what types of aid dollars are available. So colleges will get this information. You will get this information. And now what's going to come to you is something called the FAFSA Submissionary Summary. Previously, for those who completed the FAFSA, it was called the Student Aid Report or the SAR. Now you can see it's called FAFSA Submission Summary. IRS DRT, for those who filled it out in the past, you knew that you had the opportunity to have information downloaded from your taxes directly into your FAFSA form by completing the DRT, the direct or the uh, data retrieval tool. That no longer exists. The data retrieval, retrieval tool is no longer available. Every student, every parent has to give permission to have their tax returns automatically uploaded into the FAFSA. Now, what if we want to, want, don't want to do an upload of our tax information? That's fine. You're not going to receive any federal or student aid probably as a result of that. Okay? Now, the thing about it is that some parents I know in previous conversations we've had and when we were in Washington for this meeting, uh, questions were raised that, well, you know, I, I don't want my income to be shared with anybody, including my son or daughter. Okay? It's kind of my personal information. They'll never see it. You'll never see their income either. It's just an agreement to have it downloaded into the form itself. So it's nothing that gets public to the student or the parent, it's just that you're giving permission for the IRS to have that put into, into the form itself. This is where it's going to eliminate a lot of the discrepancies that may occur where in the past students were selected for this verification. This eliminates that because this is actually coming from a tax return. This is not you guessing or you 
transposing numbers from your VASPA, from your tax returns to the VASPA, these are actual dollars that are being imported. Just because you're submitting it, parents, that doesn't mean you're required to do anything as far as paying for college. It's just that the student wants to be considered for other types of aid dollars that are provided by the federal government, the state government, and the university. You'll need to complete that form. And then, again, I mentioned earlier, parents or contributors, or parents or spouses are now called contributors. Okay? So that's the terminology changes that have occurred for next year. So when you get the form, you'll see these terms on there. So you'll become familiar with that by seeing this, but you'll also see it in the form itself, too. What's the student aid index? Basically what the government's trying to do is with the information that's provided, you're gonna see that they're looking for a discretionary income, what kind of discretionary income might be available, taking into account that not all of the income that you're reporting can be used for a college education. You've got day-to-day -day living expenses, you've got retirement, you've got all types of things in which your money has to go towards to be able to live. So built into this equation are what they call protection allowances. A certain percentage of income is protected because you've got these other circumstances that you're responsible for. So here, you can see the number resulting from the evaluation of a student and family's approximate financial resources for post-secondary education. Consider that discretionary. That's the terminology that the government would use for, for that. Then you can see here, what makes up that student aid index is going to be two components. Students' information, and parents' information. So that's why on the form, when you're filling it out, there will be a student section and a parent section. And depending on how you answer that, and what you put into that, and what your tax returns get loaded into that look like, that's going to determine what your student aid index would be. This is way too much information, but I'll just give you an example of the difference between this year and last year. It used to be the EFC go no lower than zero couldn't have anything lower than a zero EFC. This year, it can be negative 1,500. Doesn't mean a student's gonna get $1,500 more in financial aid necessarily. It means that when you've got limited resources, who are the most needy of students when it comes to financial need? That index can be one indicator that helps college to determine who should get some of the more needier programs that are out. And need that students are defined or are trying to understand is not based upon necessarily the income, although it's part of the equation, a big part of the equation. It's based on the cost of school, which you're considering. So let's look at this. I'll just give you a couple examples. Let's say the total cost of the school I'm considering next year, let's say it's Sinclair, $4,000, $5,000, let's say for the year at Sinclair. I fill out this form, my student aid index comes back, says $25,000. Cost is five, I have discretionary income according to their calculations of 25, I'm not gonna qualify for some of those need-based programs because my contribution or my student aid index is much greater than the total cost of Sinclair. But if I'm looking at a school next year where the total cost is $70,000, and I'm using that same index, that index doesn't change, that index number, whatever you have, stays the same at whatever school you're going to you're gonna find that you would qualify for some of those need-based programs because the equation is this. Cost of attendance minus the student aid index equals financial need. The constant in that is the student aid index number. That stays the same no matter what school you apply to. The differential is the cost of attendance. So here's where you can make the case that sometimes it is more or less expensive to go to a more expensive school because of this calculation. So I always tell families, don't eliminate a school up front until you see what your total financial aid package is going to be from all the schools you've applied to. And then once you get your financial award letter from those schools, compare this. Compare what I call the out-of-pocket expense. What do you have to take out of your pocket in order for your son or daughter to attend that school? And I would add back into that equation, any student loans that the school is offering you as part of their financial aid package, that's money you have to pay back out of your pocket. So what's the total out-of-pocket expense? And then add that scholar or add the uh, student loans into the equation, because again, it's out-of-pocket expenditure. So this is the calculation all schools use. What's different in this would be the cost of attendance. 
What's constant is the student aid index. So if you apply to Miami, Wright State, Ohio State, UD, Sinclair, wherever you're applying, that student aid index number stays the same wherever you go. It doesn't change, okay? Now what makes up a financial aid package when a student does submit the FAFSA? It comes back to the schools in which they're considering. There are four primary areas. Two of those areas are considered what we call self-help. Students are helping themselves by borrowing, potentially, and students are helping themselves by working. Okay? The other two are the gift aid, the scholarships and the grants. And just a little word about scholarships versus grants. Grants oftentimes are what we could consider need-based dollars. Again, they're non-repayable, you don't have to pay them back, but they're non-repayable. Scholarships are oftentimes awarded to students based upon something they've demonstrated in the form of an academic performance in school. We're all familiar with athletic scholarships, we're all familiar with you know, things like that, but it's one where scholarships should be awarded to students based upon something that's different than just the ability to pay. Now, if a college or university says, okay, yeah, we've got scholarships, but you have to fill out the FAFSA to get that scholarship, I'm raising my hand right away and saying, why? Why do I need to give you my financial information if this is a merit-based scholarship? If you're looking strictly at my GPA, uh, what used to be test scores, which most schools don't use test scores any longer, but now it's primarily focused on GPA. Why do you need that information? There's a chance that could be a scholarship by terminology, but by practice it's not. It's really a need-based grant. So colleges are marketers. And so they know that a student saying, I got a scholarship, says something a little different than I got a need-based grant. I'd rather go to you know, a Christmas party and say, hey, I've got this scholarship, as opposed to saying I got a $5,000 need-based grant. So colleges are in this marketing game to use those words interchangeably. But if they are, ask the question. Why would you want to ask that question? Because the scholarship is based upon the new student aid or the new fast performance you're completing, if year two, your finances are different than year one, because you have to reapply every year, you have to go through this process every year. If your information is different in year two, your scholarship could be less in year two than it is in year one. Now, if the scholarship they award you is a four-year award, and you read that this is something you're going to get for the next four years, there may be a GPA requirement in order to keep this merit scholarship. You might have to have at least a 3.0, for example, to keep this. But you want to see, is this a four-year award or a one-year award? Is it truly need-based or is it a merit-based scholarship? And this is where a lot of confusion happens because it's our fault as the colleges trying to put our best foot forward. Everybody wants a scholarship. They don't hear so much about the grants, but they, do what, they know what scholarships are. So that's how aid dollars are kind of classified when it comes to making an award. And keep in mind, again, loans out of your pocket are going to be out of pocket expenses. You're going to pay that back at some point in time. Sources, where are the dollars coming from? Well, the federal government being one. States, so the state of Ohio has a program called the OCOG grant. Colleges and universities, private sources, which uh, Mr. Delator mentioned, and employers oftentimes you might find through your employer that there are scholarships available for uh, employees who have children going on to college. So those are primary sources where they'll come from. The vast majority of the non-repayable dollars that students receive are probably going to come from the college and university itself. So you're going to need to be aware of what do I need to do with those colleges that I'm considering to be eligible. And one of the things I can tell you that families oftentimes miss is the deadline date to apply. And then the second time they'll go through in the renewal process, year two, you are at home, students away at college, didn't read the email about the renewal date, deadline date, and now all of a sudden they miss out on year two scholarship because they missed the deadline date. So it's one you have to stay on top of, you just can't let it go once and hope that it's gonna work out for the next four years because it changes from year to year. And generally this is where, again, it's important for the student to have an identifiable email address that they can hold all of the college information because that's where it's gonna be sent to that email address or it's going to be sent to their college email address that the school established for them, for, for them when they enroll. So don't overlook those scholar or those emails that come about scholarships because those oftentimes do have pertinent information. Okay, the free application for federal student aid of the FAFSA can be filed anytime during an academic year, but no earlier than October. Well, that's a joke. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, so, again, hopefully it's in the one. So if you've been following this closely, you'll know that uh, the Congress said it has to be ready to go by November or January 1. So here's the scenario that a lot of people are worried about. On the 31st, it opens up. Everybody in the country is going to try to file a fastball on the evening of the 31st and tell me that it's not going to crash. So we'll probably have some delays. But anyway, uh, 31st is when we think it will go live, according to all that we've heard down. You can see for the 24-25 academic year, December 2023, this coming, we're in December now, and ask for the 2022 tax information. Okay, so it's going to be based on the prior year tax information. Again, you don't have to have your taxes in front of you. you just do automatic approval that you want it to deposit it into your basketball form and it takes care of it automatically. Each college university has its own priority date. So again, whatever those might be for the schools you're considering, keep track of those. I know a number of schools who've already moved their priority dates because of the fact that FAST was not available. Uh, some of those schools had a November 1 deadline date to apply. And you had to have your fast man as well too. Well, no fast ones can go in. So how do you, you know, get to that November one date if you don't have a fast one available? So they moved their dates back. Uh, and you probably get a list of those through emails from the colleges and universities. But keep in mind, again, those deadline dates are important no matter what they are. And as an example, Wright State has a priority deadline of February first. We have meetings today. We're thinking that's going to be have to be moved back, uh, just because if it doesn't go live. When they think it's going to go live, or it goes live and crashes and burns, uh, how do we expect to have that student get everything done by February 1st? So those are some of the things that we're working with as we go through our process on campus. Who should complete the FASPA? You can see, I'm not going to read them all, you can read that. But I'll say this about who should complete it. I would encourage all of you at least to do it once. Because if I've heard it once, I've heard it probably 10 or 15 times over the last couple of weeks. I know we're not going to qualify. Why spend the time completing it? It's not worth it because we're not going to get anything. And that may be true. Can't deny it. But I also will tell you there are colleges and universities that have dollars available to you because you just completed the FASP. I'll go back to my, my previous employer at the University of Dayton. You visit campus and fill out the FASP, it's a $4,000 book scholarship. You could win the lottery tonight. You're still going to get the $4,000 book scholarship, but the FAFSA has to be complete. Doesn't matter what the FAFSA says. So there's an example where that's one example. There are other examples as well too. But I would try to fill it out at least once, and that way you'll know for sure if you do or don't qualify. Another thing to note too is that a lot of times donors who give money to colleges and universities for scholarship opportunities, they'll sign a contract with that university. And in that contract, they'll put stipulations. We want this to go to students who went to Centerville High School only. Okay? And then in that, they may say, the other factor is, we want that FAFSA completed as well in order for our students to be considered for the scholarship. They don't say that you have to use necessarily the need component to award that scholarship. It just says FAFSA must be completed. So when we do a query and pull out all of the applicants who have a FAFSA on file from Centerville, that's the students are going to be evaluated for any scholarship that's available. It may not include need, it may include need, depending on the college, but we always encourage families to do it at least once so that you don't bypass any, any dollars that might be available. So you can see here, students who have to have, obviously, a degree or a high school diploma or GED, but this kind of gives you an idea of uh, who completes the form. Now here's this FSA ID or the FAFSA ID. You can do that tonight or tomorrow, but everybody needs one, okay? So you can see here, it's used for FAFSA completion. It's also used for payments down the road, paying out a loan. Students and parents need to complete their own or create their own FAFSA ID. And so this kind of gives you a look at what that page is like, because that page is live now. So everybody needs an ID, a student and parent or parents, plural if there are two parents. I would say, that here, I'll, I'll tell you what I would do, and I'll tell you why I would do it. There's so much uncertainty as to how this form's gonna be processed this year. I would have both parents do that. What we've heard, but we've not seen, is that if you're married, filing jointly, 
only one parent needs to have an ID. But that's what I was told back in July. <laughs> and I don't know that I can say that for all that I know that it's going to be the same way when this thing goes live. So I would have both parents, or wait until January to you know, fill it out and see for sure. Um, but I would encourage both to have it. And you've got it if you need it. If you don't need it, that's fine. But that's, uh, that's what I would do. Question, hmm? does each parent have to have their own email address? Right. Everybody has to have their own unique identifier email address. Because when they go to search, they search one of the search tools will be an email address, and they see two email address, null and void, invalid, because in fact there are two uh, email addresses that are the same. And generally that just throws the whole fast out of the system, and now you've got to go back and redo the whole thing. So, which again doesn't take a whole lot of time. But yes? If you have two step parents, this wizard will do that for the student. So when the student goes in and looks at their portion of the passbook, it's going to ask them to answer. I think there's six or eight questions that the student answers. It will come back and tell them who is to complete the passbook. Hmm? Yeah, if you have an ID already, yeah, as long as you've got an ID. If you were a student and you have an FSA ID from you yourself being a student, that is like your social security number. That stays with you. Yes. Uh, the process somebody mentioned earlier, uh, the other gentleman mentioned earlier about uh, an email matching another email. Is that is uh, would it would it make sense to have the parents do it first, and then the child goes in and gets some kind of specific question and say the parent can't do it. The parent, yeah, the parent can't do it until the student gives uh, sends you an invitation. You can't go in and log in until the student invites you to log in. For the application. For the fast one, yeah. Okay, so it's kind of, it sounds like it, it, there's no way to screw that up. No, and so you're gonna go in and create your ID, the student's gonna go in and create their ID, you need a social security number, a cell phone, email address, two-factor authentication, so when we go to our Amazon account, we've got two-factor, we know how that works. This is a two-factor authentication for security purposes. But you can get the ID now, but then when the student logs in to their account, and this is why I indicated earlier that maybe sitting down with your student and completing the form together can help any ambiguity that might occur, but the student has to then identify who they want to invite to complete the task. And then when that happens, then an email will be generated to whatever email address they're using, which hopefully matches the email address you're putting into your FASPA ID so that those now can be combined together. I guess that's my question. Is, I already have a FSA ID. He, needs to, oh, he just needs to know the email address you used for that FSA ID. Whatever email address you used for that previously is the one you have he has to put in there or she has to put in there to get that to you. Yes? Is the wizard part of the FSA ID or is it part of the FASPA? FASPA. So the student gets an ID, goes into their portion of the FASPA, the wizard's there, and then that will identify who the student invites to complete. And is that part available yet? No. So when I call it wizard, I'm not sure what it's going to look like. Uh, it's the Wizard of Oz, we might be in trouble, but it's a wizard like we know when you go in and do something where you're trying to figure out, you know, some other information where it gives you a drop down box and hear all the options and pick and choose, it may be really simple. This is called the Simplification Act, by the way. So when you look at the federal government, what they're trying to do here, it's called the Simplification Act, which they have simplified it, going from 108 questions down to, to uh, 38. It's such that it has simplified it for people. Yes, sir. Yes. So just so I'm clear, the parents can also... Parents can go in and create their ID. Take the resolution. Okay. <laughs> you did a much better job than that. Okay, free application, federal student aid. You can do it online. I would highly recommend you not use the paper version. Six to eight weeks, if you're lucky, probably eight to 10 weeks, it will take to process a paper application. So doing it online, and the benefit of doing it online, there are checks and balances, okay? 
if you have an answer that goes in that you don't have to worry about the rest of the questions, it automatically eliminates those questions off of the form because the way you answer it says they don't need to worry about future questions because it's all taken care of by the answer you gave in question six, let's say. And then the fast one, the phone. You can call federal student aid. I wouldn't do it on the 1st of January. Uh, <laughs> between now and the next fall, I guess, would be a good time to work the call if you wanted to do it on the phone. But uh, with the nights that Sinclair has here, you've got a golden opportunity. Not many schools do what you do here at Senate, where they have that one-on-one -on -one opportunity to sit down with a person who can walk you through that. So senior parents, take advantage of that. That's gold. That's gold. Here's what it's gonna look like. The front page, this is likely to change. But just to kind of give you a look, so they're into the blues and the blacks and the boxes and things like that. So just a little example of what you might see when you get to the page. So you can see here when you complete your fast food mess every year file. And then here's information that can tell you your one, two, three, and four. Now it comes up every now and then too, and this is again unique to the individual students, so we're not gonna to go too far into it, but sometimes students get involved in a co-op experience where they're off a semester and they're working a semester for a co-op and then school and work in school. Work with financial aid offices, they're only apply the scholarships and financial aid dollars to the period of time in which the student's taking actual credit hour work in the classroom. Now some schools, you do credit for co-op, some don't, but it's one of those things where if you're taking some time off uh, because you've got an internship or a co-op, they can work around that. They'll continue to award at the times in which you're in, in, in class. I'm not going to read all that, but this basically is the area that they talk about the tax information being directly imported into your FAST report. Okay? So again, it makes it a whole lot simpler on you just to say, yes, I get permission, automatic upload into the FAFSA form, and then all of the correct information will be posted in that form. So you don't have to worry about making a mistake. It's all there. And again, verification, about a third of every student, every applicant last year had to go through verification, wasn't checking, thinking that you made, made a mistake or tried to do anything uh, to, to get more aid. It's one where it's actually a spot check Every third student has to go through it. And again, it required a tax return being submitted to the schools. <coughs> so here's kind of the contributors. Here's how to invite. This is all on the FAFSA form. So who gets invited to complete the FAFSA with the question earlier? There's a section on there now. That you can go through and look at that. Again, parents and spouses are considered contributors now. So again, terminology changed there. But this kind of talks about how to invite the student, or the student, how the student invites you to complete the basket for them. Now we get a lot of questions oftentimes about, well, my son or daughter's on their own, they're gonna pay for their own school, we're not gonna contribute anything towards it, so they should be independent, okay? They're independent from us. In order to be an independent student, here are some of the things that you have to meet. If you meet one of those, you're not gonna be able to qualify for the uh, independent status. So that kind of gives you an example. So people say, well, they have to be 24 years of age of older, which eliminates a lot of the students from independent status because they're not gonna be 24 for another five, six years, and so automatically they're going to be dependent. Again, just because they're dependent from a financial aid standpoint, doesn't mean the parent has to contribute anything to their college education. It's just that in order to be considered for eight dollars, the parent has to complete the form. So there may be an agreement where the student says, you know what, I am gonna pay for my own school. But to be considered for any of those scholarships and financial aid dollars that the state and federal government provide, the parent has to complete that portion of the form. Again, this is all online too, so you'll end up it's gonna be, this will be on center those web pages. Unusual circumstances. So schools have the opportunity to do something called PJ, professional judgment. And oftentimes there are some unusual circumstances. If you think you fit into that category, you need to contact the schools that you've applied to. 
and you just can't go back to the fast of people and say, hey, here's an unusual circumstance. It's up to each individual college and university to make that adjustment. So if you've applied to five schools, contact those five schools and say, here are the unusual circumstances that fit into our situation. And then they may come back asking for some additional information and maybe do some type of recalculation on your student aid report, your SAI, your student aid index number, because of those uh, unusual circumstances. But we know circumstances occur. If you're looking at 2022 information, things could have changed since 2022 financially. So those are factors that come into play. And then special circumstances. So there's unusual and there's special. And so here are some things that you can look at from the special circumstances. Again, students should contact institutions, financial aid office for more information. Some schools will react to that accordingly. Some schools may not. Some schools may have enough money to reconsider an award. Some schools may not. So, but in order to find out, you need to go directly back to the schools that you're considering. Here's some examples of special circumstances. I point to the additional family members in college, because I said earlier, they're not looking at that on the form. That's not one of the questions on the form. But we know there are college, we were on a, a, a Zoom meeting about a month and a half ago, and there were 40 some colleges on there throughout Southwest Ohio. There are a couple of colleges in that uh, Zoom meeting that indicated they were gonna go back in and calculate multiple students in college for the, using their own money. Not using the federal money, because they can't by federal law, but by using their own monies that they have out of their own coffers. So you might find that some schools, so if you've got multiple students in college, Check out to see if you take that into account. Is that a special circumstance that you would evaluate and maybe make some changes to our awards? But you can see some of those that have occurred. This is not the extensive list of all, but this kind of gives you a flavor of what some of those might be. Scholarships. They were already mentioned earlier in your, in your handout. You have them and how those work here for Central students. So, Make sure you stay in touch with the financial aid, I mean with the counseling office here, because you've done everything you need to for any of the local scholarships. External scholarships, if you're trying to find out those external scholarships that might be available, here's a list of websites that you can choose. I will tell you, let's see, uh, fastweb.com right there in the middle is probably the most popular search engine for external scholarships in the country. So there's a number of them there, but those are ones that oftentimes students will turn to. And not only for upcoming first year, if you've got students that are currently enrolled, there are scholarships that they can apply for from some of these sites as well too for their sophomore year, junior year, senior year. And again, this will be on your website tomorrow, or sometime soon. Yeah, if you can't get it all in there, it'll be there for you tomorrow. <clears throat> How much federal student aid can I get? You can see here the Pell Grant's gone up. If you were a Pell Grant recipient in the past, uh, $73.95. Work study depends on the funds available for the schools to give out. Uh, and you can see here the student loans that students may be given as part of their financial aid package. First year students, typically $5,500 minus a processing fee. So the federal government <laughs> charges a processing fee or that long, so you don't get the full 5500 It's like going through and paying four years of tuition and all of a sudden you get a $100 graduation and they just gave you $30,000, you're going to charge me $100 to graduate. Uh, $6,500 for sophomore, $7,500 for junior and senior. Then there's a plus loan for parents and then financial aid that cannot exceed the total cost of the school. So when the colleges do their calculation of total cost minus that student aid index, Whatever that dollar figure is that they come up with in financial aid, it cannot exceed the total cost of the school. Okay. Where can I get more information? Here's some of those links, studentaid.gov. That's where you can find the FAFSA. There's an online chat function available to help with the FAFSA form. So there are many resources out there, but I will tell you, the best resource you have is the nights that Sinclair's here in your, in your library. That's the best resource. Yeah, so take advantage of that. 
why do I need to pay my child's permission to view financial aid award packages when I'm the one paying for my child's education? If you've heard of FERPA, if not, you will. Uh, you want to make sure that when your student, especially first year student enrolls, one of the questions that come up during orientation oftentimes is the student needs to complete a FERPA form. If you want to be informed about anything related to their, to their academics or anything related to their life going on in that campus, so I would have that conversation now to get that agreement with them that they do give permission for you to have it. Because if you called the financial aid office and that wasn't part of the equation that we were seeing, we couldn't tell you anything. That's once they turn 18. Okay. This is one that people don't oftentimes think about, but uh, sometimes it comes into play, not a lot. And it wouldn't typically be students from Senegal because they've all done so well academically here and continue to do well when they go on. Uh, but there are certain requirements you have to meet academically. There has to be a certain academic progress to maintain in order to get those scholarships and financial aid dollars. And so this is some of those things that have to occur in order to keep your aid in year two, three, and four. So there's a completion rate, cumulative GPA, 150% rule for completing a program. So those are some of the things that typically the financial aid office will talk about in the orientation period of time. Sometimes there's some chance changes where students decide they're going to take some time off and not come back until later on. Uh, you just need to be aware of that going into it because of the student uh, satisfactory progress. Tips, start checking your college email account daily. Contact financial aid offices before dropping any class. This does become a problem when a student gets a financial aid packet. It's based on the fact they're a full-time student. And what they end up doing is saying, you know what, I'm not doing well in this class. And so they go from full-time down to, to part-time. So 12 hours down to 11 hours, maybe 10 hours. That has impact on their financial aid award. Something will be reduced when students drop a class below full-time. So just know that going into it, uh, because that is such that it could be a surprise when you get the billing statement a month later after school starts saying you owe X amount of dollars. And it's because the students drop from full-time status to something less than full-time. Academic calendars, so when you're starting school, what are the deadline dates, drop ad dates, things like that, so students in the class are not doing well in, uh, they're gonna fail possibly, and so if they don't drop it within a certain time, they end up getting a W, which then goes towards that satisfactory progress, and also has impact on financial aid. So no longer are they a full-time student, they're a part-time student, because they didn't complete the necessary coursework. Those are all things that are identified in the catalog, and generally, those schools who have orientation briefly mentioned it. They don't want to spoil orientation because it's kind of like a reception and welcome to our school, but just know that these are some of the things behind the scenes that you need to at least think about. Selective service. It says that males in Ohio need to complete the selective service form. And what happens if you don't? Male students are going to get charged out-of-state tuition. So in Ohio, it used to be the FASCA form had the the ability to register for selective service on its form, on the FASCA form. No longer is that on there. Uh, it's up to the states to collect that. So the state of Ohio is saying all males need to do it. And if you don't, you're going to get out of state charges. So just keep that in mind for, for the male students that they do that registration for selective service. Looks like Sinclair offering services. We at Wright State do the same thing. You don't have to be coming to Wright State, but if you've got questions, you want to call, you're not sure about how the process works, uh, those are some email addresses there that you can see, that you can connect with us. Uh, you can come to visit. We have walk-in opportunities there as well, too. But we want to make sure we can do whatever we can to help you with this process because we know it's changing. We know there's a lot of change this year that's going to occur, and we're just worried that some of this is going to get lost in translation. And so whatever we can do to make this process easier for you, we want to make sure we do that. Yes? Can you explain the difference between subsidized and unsubsidized? Yeah, the difference between subsidized and unsubsidized loans. So a student who receives a loan, part of that may be subsidized, which means the government will cover the, the interest rate on it while the student's in school. Unsub means that it's not covered. So it's possible to have $5,500 broken up into two categories, part of it being subsidized, part of it being unsubsidized. And that could vary from different, uh, that could be different from school to school because it's based on the cost of attendance. So if you're looking at a school that's much more expensive, you might find a few more dollars that are subsidized and less dollars that are unsubsidized. Yes? What's the best way to find about hidden 
Yeah, I would just go straight to the school when you're getting down. I'm assuming that, you know, if you get to a point where you've got to nail down to one or two and you're going to make a visit, I would do it there. If not, I would call the financial aid office and say, I need a complete summary of what the total charges are, including all fees, uh, because we're trying to figure out what our total cost would be. You're going to find some fees that are going to be in there, $25, $50, things like that. But there's some fees in there that are $300 and $400. So that's the ones that I really worry about. And again, schools aren't going to advertise that on their web page. They're oftentimes going to charge it to you through the billing process. And then when you get it, think about the timing of it. Your son or daughter's already confirmed to enroll. They're there. And the bill comes in July or August. And you see another $1,000 charge from what you're anticipating. Chances are you're going to say, well, we, we, we can't afford this, but we can't afford not to have the student go. They know the roommate, they've got their books, everything's set. And so it's tough. So I would start checking now, for seniors especially, what are those hidden fees uh, that may come about that we're not seeing on the actual billing statement now or on the website? Yeah, that's changed. That's a good point. FASPA used to be you could uh, list up to 10 colleges. Now you can list 20. likely that the financial aid awards will be out. Uh, we anticipate if everything goes like they're saying it will, ASPA goes live at the end of December. What you don't know behind the scenes, we're waiting for the federal government to tell us at the college level, this is true for all colleges, give us the software that we need to, to download into our system to be able to, to produce these financial awards. We're talking about a month to six weeks until we get that download. So that's the middle of February. So my guess would be end of February to middle of March is when those first need-based financial aid awards are going to go out. Now, merit dollars are going out already. Some of you have already gotten maybe a merit scholarship offer already because that's not tied to the need. That's tied to whatever the schools have to offer out of their own endowments. But need-based, I'm guessing February, March would be the likely time frame based on what we've heard so far. Now, hopefully I'm wrong, but there's nothing that's been said that would say that that's not going to be the case. CSS? Yeah, so CSS has a form which is called the profile. And the profile is a sub, another form of an application that students might be required to complete. I think in Ohio, there's only two schools that maybe require the profile. I think that's Case and Kenyon or Oakland, I think. Yeah, Case does, Case Western Reserve in Cleveland. And so what it is is this CSS profile, College Scholarship Service, is what CSS stands for. Some colleges are saying, the results they get from the FAFSA don't give them enough information to produce an award that's going to be appropriate for the students who are coming. So they want some additional information in that. Uh, and then again, I haven't seen the CSS profile this year, but it asks different questions than what the FAFSA does, which produces some financial information. So some colleges, I think again, there's only two or three maybe in Ohio that require it, are going to look for even more information to help determine how they're going to make their awards. So if they require it, you've got to do it. Not every school does. Again, it's a very uncommon thing, but it does happen in Ohio, at least at three schools. So each school has their own requirements? So case we know, and I think Oberlin and Kenyon, I just want to say both of those schools because they're so closely tied in what they do. I think those might be the three schools in Ohio that require the profile, but there's no other school. None of the state schools in Ohio, UD doesn't require it, Miami doesn't require it, UC doesn't require it, Ohio State doesn't require it, Wittenberg doesn't require it. So, but some schools do. So when you go to their financial aid page on the web, it'll say how to apply for financial aid. It should clearly identify that the CSS profile is part of the requirement. If not, pick up the phone and call. Yes? If we are going to take advantage of the um, Sinclair 9th of January, should we still get on to FAFSA and still do that, or do we wait until that? You can do if you If you're able to get on and you're able to complete it, that's great. Uh, but if you can't, or you're not sure, or you're just not feeling comfortable about the process, then wait to come to that session, and they will sit down with you and submit it for you. I'm actually yeah, sure. So on, on those Sinclair nights, the two nights that I listed, and again, as soon as Sinclair sends us the link for you to schedule an appointment, or get that out to the senior parents, 
Once you schedule an appointment, this is what Sinclair did last year, once you schedule an appointment, they will immediately send you an email saying, you need these documents when you show up. So, but definitely have your, prior to that, your FSA ID, yeah. definitely. Yeah, and, and I would say this to the FSA ID, when you go through and submit that, it takes three to five days, so don't think you're gonna get the FSA ID completed today and then start working on the FAST and the MAR, because there's a three day, they have to verify social security information, so three to five day period of lifetime there. So do that now, and then when you do the FAST in January, you'll be better prepared. So once you create this ID, is that one thing, It's a good question. So the question was, do they go to each financial aid site? So the FAST book form that you complete is going to cover all of the need-based dollars that uh, the federal government or the state government has to offer. Some colleges may have their own individual financial aid application in addition to the FAST book. Some colleges like have their own scholarship application. You might have to fill out a separate application for some of the merit scholarships. So, Again, stay in tune with the scholar, with the financial aid pages of the schools you're considering to know for sure what the requirement is. So it could be a profile, it could be a FAFSA application, I mean, scholarship application, it could be a separate financial aid application. Every school is uniquely different in how they issue their awards. So check on the web or call or when you're visiting them, meet with one of the financial aid staff on that visit to make sure you've done everything you need. And deadline dates are.